We now return to the House Oversight Committee's examination of a recent audit of internal House operations. The House authorized the audit, which covers the period of October 1993 through December 94. After this program, we'll hear from a bipartisan group of House leaders as they react to the audit. I've got two. There you go. Yeah. That's why I banged the gavel. Is it have to be No. It's really too. The meeting will come to order. In the absence of uh, Chairman Thomas, I'll continue the hearing. And uh, by coincidence, it was my turn to begin the questioning process, which would be convenient since I'm in the chair of won't be bound by the five-minute limit, <laughs> unless Mr. Pasteur objects. <laughs> uh, just a few comments. First of all, I, uh, I commend all of you for your work on this project. It was clear to me, I've only been here a year and a half, but it was clear to me within a month or two after I got here that there were major problems. And I've always been concerned about uh, doing things appropriately in public office and particularly in terms of the operation of my own office and was very frustrated that I could not even get the information I needed to make good decisions within my office in terms of budgeting and deciding uh, how much money was left in my budget for the year, making sure I did not overexpend. In spite of re repeated queries, I could not find out. I simply could not get the information and it was clear to me that something major was wrong. Reached the point where early last fall I instructed my staff to begin setting up our own accounting system in our office so I could keep track of myself and, and to know that I would not get into trouble. Now that's an incredible waste of resources to have to do that. I was pleased when uh, we took the majority and it was clear we were going to have a complete house audit and I could stop that project and depend on you to take care of the problem. But I commend you for what you've done. Uh, the information you've provided this morning is frankly no surprise to me. It was uh, perhaps in degree worse than I had expected, but I certainly expected virtually everything you had said. My questions will deal almost exclusively with the house information systems, the computer operation, because that I have the greatest familiarity with. And I think it's valid to spend some time on that because roughly one third of this report deals with problems revolving around that. Again, there were no surprises. Uh, I commend you for your recommendation to terminate the development of the database system. Uh, as you have pointed out, we already spent $5 million on that. It was money not well spent and something that we should terminate, and I'm pleased that we have. Uh, the, uh, on the security issues, as, as chair of the computer working group, I'm very concerned about that, but frankly, we've spent very little time on that because I knew that was a direct concern of you, Mr. Lanehard, and you have expertise in that area, and I was confident that you would check that out. On the plus side, I am pleased that you found as few problems as you did. And I know in your mind they're horrendous, <laughs> but from my mind, coming in and seeing the system uh, for the first time and knowing what could be done, I, I, I frankly expected worse. So I think... Uh, on that score, we're, we're in better shape than I expected, but I certainly support your recommendations in terms of uh, changing the security process, hiring someone who is an expert in this. Uh, clearly, that has to be done and will be done, but that's a problem that's fairly readily uh, uh, taken care of with, with adequate attention. I do have a specific question, and I don't know, uh, Mr. Lanehart or Mr. Crairn, which one of you would respond to this, but you, you cite the need for establishing a better security system and control over the office systems. Now, one of the proposals I expect will come out of our working group, and we're approaching it from the standpoint of better management and considerable cost savings. We think we can save uh, perhaps a couple million dollars by going to uh, much larger servers, much fewer service servers on the backbone rather than in members' offices, uh, servers that are operated, serviced, and maintained by HIR rather than by vendors or members' offices. Uh, as I say, we're approaching that from the standpoint of better operations and saving money. It seems to me, however, that also would address some of your concerns about security. And I just want to see whether, in fact, that, that perception of mine is correct, that by having fewer servers 
having them on the backbone and uh, controlled and supervised by HIR, HIR that we can improve the security of our system as compared to the present system where we have over 1,100 servers uh, located in members' offices. Is my perception on that correct? Do Let me make a general statement and then uh, see if Tom wants to, uh, to elaborate on it with some of the staff that were doing the audit work. Um, but as a general uh, issue, I think the, the thing that concerns me the most, I guess, is the attention to the security issue from HIR. Um, we, issued, or we talked about it in our audit reports. We had a number of meetings with the staff that that function right now is, is very understaffed and um, they don't necessarily have the skills that are needed in the, the local area network uh, environment, the office level environment. They were mainly concentrating on the uh, mainframe computer systems. So I think it is a good approach if properly staffed and equipped with the skills that are needed for HIR to do it. It certainly is a lot makes a lot more sense to have one organization responsible for that than it does to have, as you indicated, all the, uh, the members' offices, vendors to be responsible for it, et cetera. So it's definitely a move in the right direction with that caveat of properly staffed and, yes. uh, and skilled professionals. Right, and I'm operating from the assumption that we will, in fact, take dramatic steps to improve security. So thank you. The, your report also cites the need to establish an encryption standard, and you mentioned partic particularly uh, such as DES as a tool to govern data transmitted uh, from office to office or uh, between any parties within the House. Are you particularly recommending D or DES, or are you uh, open to considering other encryption standards such as the, the PEM, uh, the Privacy Enhanced Mail, or others that might serve as well? Uh, when I get some some help on I'm that. Not, I'm not an expert on <laughs> that, but I'll turn to my experts. Let's turn to the, the ones that did the work, if you don't mind. All right. Mike? This is Mike Donahue, who is the, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, who's the partner in charge of the uh, CIA computer audit segment of our work. All right. Could you uh, move the microphone close to him? Sure. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, I think the issue is to establish the risks that you're facing in your communication systems, correspondence systems, electronic mail systems, and come up with a measure of security. That security can include encryption. Many software project products are using encryption as a feature. Uh, right now, you're dealing with 11 different uh, email systems, uh, which prevents uh, any encryption capability. So I don't think we're necessarily saying DES is the answer. The answer is really an encryption standard Mm -hmm. and not necessarily to encrypt everything, but just the sensitive information that you're uh, okay. transmitting around the systems. Thank you. I wanted to clarify that. And while you mentioned the email, you recommend that we have simply one email system, which was also uh, my starting point in the entire reevaluation of what we have here. I, I cannot believe uh, having 11. However, we are moving in the direction of concentrating on messaging systems which can communicate with each other and uh, each messaging system might have its own email system. I do not imagine we would have more than two or three. Uh, would your objection to having multiple email systems be removed if they can all be encrypted to the same standard? Well, I think you need a standardization standpoint and also from a compatibility between the various email packages. Right. And right now, as you know, you have a switch in place to sort of handle that uh, handshake between package and package, so I think we would say that the fewer the packages you deal with, uh, the easier it will be to, to manage from, a, from an operational standpoint and also to implement security in a more reasonable basis. I would agree with that. I, I think we can probably uh, give members a choice of two or three and still maintain compatibility. Uh, I don't know if it appeared in your, your uh, report at all, but I've done some independent investigation. I think we can save another 150 to 200,000 by getting away from the soft switch method, which we currently have, to handle the, all the incompatible email systems. And so that's uh, also one of my hopes, and that we uh, either get rid of it or minimize it as much as possible. Because <coughs> I think that's a good share of our problem too, in addition to costing extra money. The um, the uh, issue of user support to, uh, to quite some extent. And I'm wondering if you have any, whether you've computed or whether you have uh, industry information on what, what is the average amount that 
that should be spent on user support and did you compute how much the house currently spends on user support? Have, any of you, have you dealt with the, any of that at all? Not in the security area. All right. No, sir. All right, we, we are moving in the direction of much greater user support. Uh, clearly, we don't have enough at this point, but it'd be helpful if there is uh, an industry standard on that, then we'll have a benchmark to aim at, and we'll, we'll have further discussions on that. Uh, final question, your report uh, suggests the House should use the services of Lexus Nexus or some other type of similar service instead of the MIN or ISIS systems. Uh, I, uh, did you perform a cost analysis of that alternative? And uh, do you have any figures on what the costs are currently of delivering MIN and ISIS to the users on the system? Another partner from uh, Price Waterhouse that did that segment yeah. of the audit. Whenever you have 40,000 hours worth of work, you have a lot of partners involved. So yes. Fred Fagerstrom uh, was involved with that segment of our work. Well, Mr. I wish Chairman. we had had as many involved on the, on the part of our House Oversight staff in <laughs> doing our planning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we did not directly do a cost-benefit analysis. And what we recommended is looking at uh, competitive services such as LexisNexis as a potential replacement for the MIN and ISIS systems uh, according to government standards is to uh, perform, look to commercially available functions that are out in the marketplace when they are available mm -hmm. and to see if those are that. But we did not do a specific cost benefit analysis of that. So your recommendation then comes just from your general uh, recommendation that whenever there's Packages available, whether software or services, that we should use that rather than generating. At, at least consider that. Yes. To see right. if there is anything that is unique to your operation that would warrant uh, a custom developed system <coughs> as opposed to a commercially available system. Commercially available systems, as you know, are uh, with a much broader base of operations, it is generally more cost effective for them to maintain that, to keep that up to uh, current technology as it's spread across many users than it is for a custom developed system. Fine, thank you. I might just add for the record and for the information of everyone here that uh, yeah, the working group is moving in the direction of phasing out men and uh, probably ISIS. But I, I, uh, on this particular point, I don't think Lexus and Nexus is going to be able to provide the information needed. It can provide the information needed in the typical member's office. But for ledge council and for those working on drafting the legislation, they need uh, better search capabilities and more information <coughs> available than you can get from simply Lexus and Nexus. So we have to uh, we have to come up with some sort of hybrid system. But I think we can do it at fairly low cost, building on what we have. Uh, my final comment on this uh, is is not for the auditors, but to to recognize someone who's uh, contributed a great deal to the process from the standpoint of the House Oversight Committee and particularly the Computer Working Group, uh, Judy Boonstra. Judy, why don't you stand up? Some people may not know you. Uh, Judy Boonstra has come, came in at the beginning of the year and has been working uh, furiously on trying to evaluate our computer system and make recommendations for improvement and has done yeoman service working often uh, day and night and weekends. And as I said, it would be nice to, nice to have 125 partners, or maybe even three, uh, working on this. But uh, due to the, the uh, budget of House Oversight Committee being somewhat limited, uh, Judy was the only staff member that we were able to hire. And she's just done a fantastic job. And I want to publicly acknowledge that and thank her. Having said that, we'll move on to, uh, to others who may have questions. And tradition is to alternate sides, so Mr. Pastor. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, first of all, let me make a statement in support of the, the audit. Uh, when the issue was before us in January, I supported the idea of going forward with an audit. I came from a former government, uh, local government, that we had uh, periodic audits. And uh, it was to ensure us that we were doing things we we're doing them well, and if there were problems, that we could correct them. And so I'm very happy that uh, we have taken the first step. And I look forward to other audits and more recommendations, because it's very important that we 
ensure that uh, we're doing everything legally and, and proper. So I, I have no problem with audits and I support and I commend the new majority for going forward with it. I also would like to make a statement, Mr. Chairman. I commend uh, Chairman Thomas and uh, the ranking member uh, Fazio for the agreement they have reached and, and, <clears throat> and they're going to forward to the Inspector General uh, uh, for forensic uh, auditing any uh, problems that uh, Pricewaterhouse House have seen. I know that uh, the Inspector General will be under great pressure by the media to provide tidbits and hopefully, and I know that he will <coughs> ensure that there's integrity to the system and, uh, and will go forward with the forensic audit and when uh, there needs to be further investigation and, and further determinations that he will go forward with that and I, I hope that the integrity of, of the whole process uh, uh, will continue forward. As we talked earlier about uh, unqualified uh, opinions, uh, they're very difficult to get, and uh, I look forward to the day, hopefully, when we have one here for the House. But uh, the immediate concern that I see, pound gorilla, is our <coughs> financial management services. We spend five million dollars to have a system that's inadequate, um, and until we correct that, we may have members uh, submitting. Uh, vouchers, uh, their receipts, uh, and still may not be getting uh, adequate information in terms of their own budgets. Uh, I, I see what that, and one of your recommendations is to stop the current project, and I agree with you. Uh, what would be the interim uh, step uh, in ensuring that when I turn in my vouchers or the members from this committee turn in their vouchers uh, uh, tomorrow or the following? following weeks that uh, they're going to have the proper attention. It's my understanding that the uh, Chief Administrative Officer's uh, staff is preparing a proposal to the committee to uh, go to another accounting system that will put the, uh, the House on an accrual-based accounting system by 1 October of this year. Um, that being the case, that would be the interim solution. Um, it's still not going to be easy. Uh, there are a lot of records that will have to be converted. The staff in the finance office, uh, in my opinion, um, will have to be uh, increased in, in quantity and quality, both, really. Uh, different mindset for accrual-based accounting versus cash basis. Uh, and training will be involved as well. Um, Tom, would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, <coughs> concern, I think, is well-founded over that. Even you do, and I think my advice uh, would be that members are probably going to have to be diligent, or their staffs are going to have to be more diligent in the near term because uh, you're on your present system, F, which is called FMS, um, until the new one place it. And I think there is, I think you're correct in your observation that there is some risk to that. My advice would be is that individual members uh, are probably going to have to be much more diligent in inquiring about their allowances and inquiring about outstanding bills and so on and so forth. I don't think there's a good solution, certainly not a good technology solution in the near term. In, in your experience, another, another problem you're going to have is the Office of Finance isn't really staffed yet to operate in that new kind of an environment. So it could easily slip. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't warn you of that, perhaps by several months is my own view. Um, so I think it, is, it will be necessary to keep the pressure on uh, HIR. I think it is important that it be done as soon as possible. So we may be looking forward uh, not only for a new system, uh, some slippage, but uh, additional personnel in several new offices, uh, or at least uh, financial in the financial office. That's correct. Very right. possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. <coughs> Next, the... Uh, Long-term SAGE member of the committee, from the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Roberts. I think we're in the SAGE brush, <coughs> as opposed to being SAGEs. Uh, Mr. Lanehart, <coughs> um, Mr. Craren has indicated, or pretty well summed this up, uh, or described the operation of the House as a disservice to members. Uh, we have now learned from Mr. Pastor's comments and others that uh, 
uh, members should be advised to take a lot more personal responsibility in terms of their accounts. I think they do now. <clears throat> I just don't think they had any realization uh, that the finance office uh, was suffering from this kind of, uh, of disrepair or the lack of organization. Uh, not only is it a disservice to members, but our constituents, and really uh, a confidence factor in the whole House. I suppose if the bad news is that we have, an un we, we have really uh, started to um, unearth a can of worms, it's an old can and large worms, uh, in a rather Byzantine netherworld of uh, a hodgepodge system, the good news, as has been indicated by the chairman and the ranking member, is that we are, in fact, uh, changing the way we are doing business. <clears throat> and that's the light of day, and anybody that has dealt with earthworms knows if you have the light of day, well, they go away. And I hope that that will be the case. Uh, with apologies to members, I, I was talking to another member on the floor. He suggested that, uh, that the following was the case. Uh, Humpty House sat on a wall. Humpty House had a great fall. All of the appropriate men and horses uh, couldn't put Humpty House uh, back together again. Uh, we, in fact, are constructing a new wall and a new house. In that respect, I have to say that while um, I expected some problems, uh, being a member of the Franking Commission, <clears throat> I am a little stunned uh, by the information in your summary here on pages 110 and 111. And I notice that you have made three recommendations in regards to the Congressional Frank. Now, we have been in the business of reforming the Frank for several sessions of Congress, uh, but I have asked appropriate staff on the Franking Commission uh, about your information here where you're saying three instances out of 283 exception letters reviewed uh, where the committee uh, approved the printing content or the uh, uh, contracts here, and I'm informed by staff that over 250 times uh, that the vouchers were never submitted to the Franking Commission but approved by a letter of exception. We don't have exceptions anymore. They're gone, uh, you know, thank goodness. But you have made three recommendations. Would you please briefly uh, highlight those recommendations on how we can get back on track in, re in regard to the Congressional Frank? I think that's very important. Okay. Okay, it's I'm on, page, uh, I'm on 111. page 111 of the financial audit. Um, well, the, the, our, our, I guess our concern is this, is um, there's a loss of control between um, the verbal approval and verifying that it actually did take place if you go through the records. In other words, uh, I think they're supposed to have a letter from the Franking Commission approving the mass mailing. That is the practice now. And often they will start, they will go to the folding room only with a verbal go-ahead and there's no verification at that level. And I'm going to turn to my staff person that worked on this and ask him, Pat McNamee, who's a, worked in this area, to, to help me. Would you would you please move the microphone close? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what you just described, Tom, is correct, that uh, the initial approach by a member staff to the Franking Commission would be with a printer's proof of a proposed mass mailing, and there would be a verbal go-ahead if that met the rules of the Franking Commission for content. After that, the printer's proof, you would have the final mass mailing printed a staff member would bring that down to the folding room for folding and, and turn over to the Postal Service. And there was no written approval at that time given to the folding room, so they would know that, in fact, it had been approved by the Franking Commission. So you don't know, really, if it had been approved by the Franking Commission? Correct. Except for the letters of exception that were granted? Well, there's also a situation with the changes in technology <coughs> where a number of members are able to do desktop publishing. Yes. And so there would not be printing vouchers uh, that they would be turning over to the finance office for processing. Okay, I can I can uh, I can say for the benefit of members that as a member of the Franking Commission, many times the only time we got involved was whether there was a dispute, and if we were able to put in a control system like this one, it would obviate the obvious problem that got a little partisan uh, when members of various campaign committees would wander the halls as you approach the deadline uh, th by which the, uh, th the mail had to be mailed. And you had people walking up and down and all of a sudden saying, gotcha, uh, this in particular mailing might exceed the deadline. Thus reporting saying to the Franking Commission. 
of course, if, as you looked at the, uh, at the amount of printing that was stacked up in the halls prior to the deadline, it became uh, almost ludicrous in regards to a, a timely dissemination of the Frank material. Now, we have come through a great difficult time in terms of the cost of the mailing, limited the mailings, uh, reducing the funds uh, uh, safe for mailings, trying to better uh, put a hold on the mass mailings, only to find out there was no, there was no really no real control of the folding room. Is that uh, you know, pretty much the case? That's correct. There's not an audit trail there to determine uh, whether what went to the Franking Commission is what in fact got mailed. Well, number one, we have no exceptions now. Number two, we have a letter of approval. This is the kind of thing that we can stop right now. We don't have to wait on it you know, for six months, but this is replete uh, with the suggestions that we have to come forward with. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much, and I want to again associate myself with the remarks of the full committee chairman and the ranking member. Uh, my time has expired, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowland. The gentlewoman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for coming before us today. A lot of us who had served on this committee before had suspicions along this line, and uh, I, I think uh, the wisdom in, in <coughs> proposing an audit is very great. It, it, is all, it always provides a great service for people in charge because it clears them really of uh, any challenges of abuse or fraud or whatever and now we're just trying to get into this as the new majority and I think the wisdom is obvious and uh, it will take us in the right direction. I wonder for purposes of basic understanding if, uh, if you Mr. Craren could uh, define for me the seriousness of uh, the no opinion finding on the financial statements. Uh, how often does this happen in your audits? Uh, what percentage of audits result in a no opinion finding? Can you clarify this for us, please? Uh, in the private sector, it's unheard of. Um, and, and as I say, and for many state and local governments, it's unheard of. Uh, and the reason for that is if you have to borrow money from your bank or if you have to access the capital markets uh, for a bond issuance, they will normally insist um, on a clean opinion typically from your auditor. It's more typical in the federal government um, because there's not that direct link between access to funds and, and uh, how well a particular organization operates. So it's quite typical of federal departments and agencies to get disclaimers for many of the same reasons here. Uh, in, in the other audits you've done in the federal government, can you list for us the situations where you would have a no opinion result in an audit? Uh, for the ones I have done, we have issued a disclaimer for a number of years on HUD, uh, which probably isn't too surprising. Um, and then for the components of HUD that I've been associated with, uh, the other ones that we have issued opinions are for the Veterans Administration, um, and then those are the two that I've, I've done. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to ask you a question having to do with these warehouses that uh, the House uh, has been leasing space in. Is, are there two warehouses that we've been leasing space in, to your knowledge? I'm going I'm to ask again the, one of my staff to, to help answer the question. This is, this, this is uh, Jim Pauley. Jim Pauley. Who, um, no, primarily it's at the Star Warehouse that you've been leasing. And that's the one owned by the Washington Post, is that right? Uh, I yes. believe that's correct. And uh, the second warehouse? Um, I, I think there's only one that, that we looked at, and that was the one at the Star Warehouse. The sergeant, uh, the, the um, architect may, may have other spaces at, at other warehouses. Can you describe to us what sorts of things were st uh, stored in, in that Star Warehouse um, and, and uh, what we were paying for storage annually? Uh, annually, it was about 170000 a year. Uh, for your storage um, over the audit period that's about uh, two hundred and ten thousand dollars or, or close to a quarter million um, sixty one percent or sixty percent of, of, of what was stored in the warehouse was uh, uh, belonged to office furnishings um, primarily surplus furniture uh, items of waiting shop work etc uh, probably approximately 72% of what was in that, uh, the office furnishings uh, part of the warehouse had not been uh, removed for more than six months. Uh, had it been sitting there? And, uh, and, 
and that was 60% of what was stored there. How much of the storage space were we making use of? Uh, I, I believe all of the storage space had been allocated to different offices. So, for example, office furnishings had 60%, and then the majority of the rest of it was uh, publications and distributions. Um, and what they were primarily storing were old printed material, um, old reports and that type of thing. And then they also had a lot of packing material in there. So you're talking about, uh, for example, agricultural books from 1973 and empty cardboard cartons and that sort of thing? Exactly right. Is there anything else? The, I mean, the point, the point being is that it is, it is uh, you're storing obsolete uh, materials that you're paying for and that that's a, that's a potential savings that we're recommending you take advantage of. And, and what is that amount of savings that you recommend? That's, we think that's 170000 that will save you $170,000 annually. And uh, according to what the gentleman just testified to, that's what we're paying per year. Are you suggesting that we close down all our storage? I think that's an extra floor in the warehouse. We're not suggesting shutting it all down, but we're just suggesting the parts of the warehouse that you're leasing to store um, things that you don't need to store, you should just dispose of, you should get out of. But you do need some storage, storage space over the Star Warehouse, we think. I'm just a little unclear about these numbers here. It's my understanding that we did have a second storehouse and that the total we were spending per year was a quarter of a million dollars on storage, that it was badly managed, that there was no oversight, that we were storing things there in a haphazard way. Is that generally what your conclusion was? Um, if we could, we, we could get we could get back to you with the details. It's, uh, uh, we'll be happy to look that up and get back to you. We don't, I don't have that tip of my fingers. No, yeah, in the report, we were focusing on what was the use of the Star Warehouse because that was where we thought uh, we found the most problems with what was in there. And, and so that's what we focused on. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, gentlemen, could you please explain to this committee how procurement and purchasing were done and uh, what recommendations you have made as to these processes and, uh, and uh, how your recommendations will improve the procurement and purchasing processes. In the past, uh, procurement was done by each individual office separately with different rules and regulations that they were following. Uh, for example, you could have computer software that could be bought in HIS, in the Office of Furnishings, in the Office of Finance um, and Supply Store and uh, Systems Management as well. So a number of different places that you can buy uh, software from, as an example. Each office had the different rules about uh, limits of uh, whether they go competitively, get three bids. It was just pretty much uh, across the board, um, the lack of control as to how this was being performed uh, with the new uh, Chief Administrative Officer's uh, organization he has established a uh, uh, one office responsible for procurement. That office will, will implement our recommendations dealing with uh, having policies and procedures dealing with procurement that will cover the whole house, uh, making sure that there's oversight so that uh, you don't have sole source uh, contracts going on so that um, procurements are done at arm's length, those kind of things. So in the past, it was just uh, across the board. Everybody or a lot of the offices could, could do procurement, and nobody was monitoring what was being done. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Thank you very much. I would just comment, uh, we have already canceled the lease, have we not, on the, one, the Star Warehouse? I know we've stopped funding for it in next year's budget. It's that's, removed that's from the appropriations bill. That's correct. Thank you. Next, the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Name. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, also it's a pleasure to be sitting uh, here next to my colleague, Sam Brownback, who came in a freshman class from Topeka and, and started all this, and we thank you for it, uh, for carrying that through the uh, floor. You know, we're supposed to be the stewards of our nation's treasury, and I guess that's the, the one surprise um, that, that I've seen in this, that uh, the fact that this is so out of order, and the fact that we can't come to a conclusion. And which makes me think that, you know, surely someone within the system had to realize, and maybe, and I would say not, not the members, but within the financial system had to realize that uh, this just wasn't working. Uh, so I don't know if there was an uh, individual or, uh, or where the complete flaw was in the system where we will ever know how it got so out of order. But it just does bring to mind that if this were a business or a union, 
that conducted itself in this manner, this Congress would probably have them sit here and be grilling them in congressional hearing. And uh, which I'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Lanehart comes to one question in my mind. Uh, what, what were the primary reasons that it got to this situation? And the previous committee to this House administration, what was its, its role uh, in it? And were the, were the waivers and the exceptions also a part of a problem that set the finance office off? Or, you know, what, what's basically the reason it got to this point? Well, I can't go back too far because I just came on board uh, November of 93 myself. But in talking to the, the former officers of the House, in talking to the managers of the finance office, et cetera, um, it appears to me that they were under a false impression that this was uh, a good system of accounting, a cash basis. Um, they were getting audit reports uh, from the general accounting office that indicated that uh, you know, everything was fine. It was an unqualified opinion on the very limited scope of those audits. And uh, they really felt that they had things under control. Um, and I don't think that's the case, obviously, from the results of our work. But nobody had looked at it uh, from a, an objective perspective, total uh, audit of the House, um, total look at the financial statements and operations. And I think that's really the, the major uh, problem is you're happy doing what you're doing. You're told that everything's going okay, so you just want to continue on with it. Don't fix it if it's not broken. Um, our independent audit showed that it was broken. Um, I think the exceptions that were granted uh, by the committee did um, hinder people from understanding the process, uh, made it uh, prone to error, if you will and uh, certainly didn't, didn't help in the, uh, in the running of the financial operations of the House. Thank you. <clears throat> also, I have a question for uh, Mr. Crerin, Price Waterhouse. Uh, many of the solutions that were stated you know, were to privatize or outsource. And as you know, the committee has, has uh, accomplished some of that. When we look at <clears throat> further privatization or the efforts that we've already uh, accomplished here in the committee, is it just a, a, an expedient political solution to privatize it and get it out of our hair, or <coughs> it, is it actually cost savings in most cases? In, in many cases it is. I won't say that's the only solution. Um, what we tried to do is benchmark your operations so what we could find is a best <coughs> practice and give you some options of how to get to, from point A to point B. In some casing, outsourcing is very logical because there are many cases in, in uh, package software, for example, uh, they tend to do a better job making software than people that try to develop it in-house. Uh, there are other cases where that's not so clear-cut. So we're not you know, categorically stating that's the only way to go. Uh, we did use it heavily as a basis for benchmarking your operations, though. So obviously that would help uh, with privatization of certain parts of the system. And also what I'm gathering is you know, some type of standard-based accounting uh, initiative where we have some set patterns of, of through computerization and then the accrual counting system. Right. To allow your, yourself to better compare yourself to the private sector, you have to get on that basis of accounting because right now you're not entirely sure in some cases how you compare. I think what's scary, uh, it should be scary for members, a member does everything in the right proper way. It goes into the system and through no fault of their own, uh, you know, something's not paid uh, due to the way the system was, was operated. And I, that ought to scare a member, so I at least we'll come out of this, hopefully, of not uh, in the future having uh, members accidentally uh, look like they have done some, something improper. One last question I have, and, and I've asked this uh, uh, since I've been here, and, and I've talked to the CAO about it, and, and it's shocking. When I arrived, I found out that in the district offices and in D.C., furniture is just widely moved, uh, taken down hallways, sat in hallways. You pick up, if it, if it says, do not touch, a lot of people still touch it and take it. And if there's no sign on it, people take it to their offices. Also, members that are going out of Congress say, well, I would like to purchase this and that from the district offices. So I, I know there was wide-scale purchasing, which was legal under the house rules, but purchasing of furniture. Do we have any accounting, even in the last two or three years, or four or five, to
to know what furniture and what district offices went to, to whom or where it's at? Uh, you do barcode certain of your of your assets, but there are a number of problems with it. It's not, again, it doesn't really fit a traditional property and equipment system that we're accustomed to seeing in terms of tracking not just the existence of the property, but its value as well. And uh, that is one of the weaknesses we've cited. So um, there are lags also. GSA does inventories when a member is uh, uh, leaves office, and those also l tend to lag pretty far after the fact. So you do need to improve both how you keep track of your assets and how you how often you inventory them, especially the high val high dollar value assets. I, I just don't believe any member of Congress or staff should be able to purchase anything. It should go back in the system. If it's not needed, it goes to, to auction, and then they would have an option. But at least if they're going to do it, we, we should keep track of, of what was where. And I know some of that furniture spans a long time. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you very much. We have a guest with us today who has been very patiently uh, sitting through the meeting, Mr. Brownback, the gentleman from Kansas. Uh, committee rules allow a guest to also join in the questioning with unanimous consent, and I ask unanimous consent from the committee to permit Mr. Brownback. Hearing no objection, uh, we're happy to have you here, and we thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy to grant you five minutes of time. Thank you uh, very much for that. I had the pleasure of carrying this bill on opening day uh, that passed 430 to 1, which I couldn't believe anybody could vote against it. But I, I said then that I thought we needed to look expansively. I'm delighted <coughs> that we're here today uh, uh, doing this. seems to me that for a, uh, a festering boil to a heel, it's got to be lanced, and perhaps we've lanced it uh, coming forward. Um, a couple of quick questions on it. Bob's uh, instance of what he cited to this law of capture that we've got around this place where if it's in the hallways and you can catch it you and kill it, it's yours. Uh, I, I found that hard to believe. And it also seems like we've got a kind of an old time plantation style mentality. If you sit on top, you're the master of it, then the system works for you. And regardless of the accounting in it. Um, what, what do you like in the system, too, that you've just uh, audited expansively? Uh, Tom, what do, what do you th think it's like? Uh, well, I've tried not to, you know, be too <coughs> descriptive in how I've described it, other than to say that uh, the, the part that I think was, was the weakest was the lack of public accountability. I think, I think that's probably the most important control you can put in, is the minute you begin to publish financial statements, the minute you begin to benchmark the organization, those sorts of things, any sort of thing that's, that could be perceived as uh, wrong, uh, just somehow doesn't happen anymore. So, uh, you know, going at this totally objectively, that was my cut. It was, gee, let's, let's agree that the number one control is public accountability, and then after that, I think you can see a lot of the, the wrongs, as you've uh, described, uh, heal themselves. So just open it up and providing some public accountability within that system, but you won't you won't compare what sort of our operation. It's not it's an antiquated system at best. It's hard. I haven't seen anything like it to be honest with you. I I've I've seen a lot in the federal government, but I haven't seen anything quite like the House in a number of ways. And anything in the former Soviet Union or anything like that? I haven't <laughs> done any auditing there. Happily, I have not been there doing auditing work. What? How far back uh, should we be looking to try to determine if uh, what improvements we should make in the system and what things went wrong within the system? How far back should we be looking? I don't know. Well, I think one of the biggest problems that we have is just the, the systems giving us the information, the support to go back in, in, in time. And I think the systems are fairly archaic with respect to that. For our, so our ability to go back far is not, not great. Um, what we've looked at is 15 months. We believe that we can go back on the, the issues that have been identified by Price Waterhouse. But beyond that, we'd probably be very hard pressed. Tom could maybe uh, get into some more detail. Uh, because of the nature of your systems, you're in a paper environment. And uh, if you want to find out anything about a particular transaction, you quickly have to get into the vouchering and the backup documents in the Office of Finance. So that makes 
uh, going back and doing anything comprehensively very laborious. I mean, we strongly prefer auditing using a computer that will allow us to target better. But one of the uh, problems with your system is we can't go very far before we find out that we have to get into paper. And well, that's a very that's a very expensive thing, frankly, to audit through. Well, from what you've seen thus far, even though it is a laborious system to go back through, uh, to get of a full accounting to the American people, how far back should we be looking? I, I really can't answer that question, sir. It's uh, difficult for me to say. Are there troubling things you've found in the past 15 months <coughs> of the paper trail and the laborious time that this has consumed that lead you to think that there are things that the public ought to know about if we look further? Uh, possibly, but I, I don't know for sure. There's a number of things that require you know, further work that we've said we're going to refer. You know, I can't tell you how far back, based on that, I would recommend going, frankly. I don't know if it would be three years, four years, five years, or, uh, you know, whether the, there's diminishing returns after you go back any further than we have. I just, it's difficult for me to say. Are there things that pique your curiosity for us to go and look further back? Uh, again, the things that I've referred, I think, piqued our curiosity, um, and that's <coughs> in the sense that they were... Uh, you know, potential violations of what of the requirements and rules the House set for itself, and we did uh, refer those. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, uh, we didn't find anything else. It was uh, we found certain things that yes, that we think needed more work to be done. On. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank for you, accommodating me. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. Just a few comments in closing. Certainly want to thank you once again for your work and for coming here and for the report you've given. Mr. Kern, you your firm has issued no opinion because it was such a mess you couldn't even generate an opinion. I can assure you and the public and our colleagues that every member on this committee has an opinion. And our opinion is that we, to be very frank, we have a mess in our hands. And I also want to assure my colleagues and the American public that we will clean it up as a committee and we will address the problems and deal with them as quickly as possible. Thank you once again. Thank you to members of the committee. The meeting stands adjourned. Partisan group of House leaders met with reporters on Capitol Hill to react to the audit results. This half hour briefing begins with House Speaker Newt Gingrich and Minority Leader Richard Gephardt. Let me uh, thank all of you for coming. We, as you know, uh, when we ran and said if we were a majority, we would institute a professional audit. Uh, we have now gone through phase one of that process. Price Waterhouse has reported back the audit, and uh, Chairman Tominitz and I think Ranking Member uh, Fazio will be here in a minute. We'll both talk about that aspect of it. We said we would go through a whole series of changes that are congressional reforms. And I think it's important.